Hello, and welcome to the Enneagram 2.0 podcast. I'm Beatrice Chestnut. I'm Murano Pais. And today, we're talking about funny stories about the nine types. Let's have some fun today. Yes, let's talk about funny experiences we've had with people of different types. Students of ours sometimes, or family members, or friends. Yeah, any kind of humorous anecdotes we may have to tell, partly as a way for people to both understand the nine types and appreciate them, just in terms of the ways they can sometimes be funny. You know, B, I think the nine personalities are all very silly in a way. <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes we talk about when we're in ego, we can all be a bit absurd. Yes, and it's good if we see the absurd in us, right? And and the capacity of laughing at ourselves is, I think, a uh, higher level capacity. Yes, it was funny as we were trying to think of funny stories and humorous anecdotes, uh, both about from our own personal experience and maybe from the people we've worked with. I found that I started really thinking a lot about the more serious parts, but I think it can be very important to also remember uh, to, to be light about some of these things, to not take ourselves so seriously, especially not to judge ourselves once we start working on ourselves. Yes, yes. And to always be looking a little bit at what is a little bit crazy about the ways that we are when we're in our personality. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great idea. And I can't wait to hear your fun stories, B. Another thing is we often hear from people who listen to our podcasts or uh, have uh, come to our courses that one of the ways that they learn about the Enneagram, one of the ways that the information about the Enneagram and the types really stays with them is through hearing funny stories about mm -hmm. the types, even if it's just something short, uh, something uh, just something that a, a way that a type responded to something or a way they put things in words in a unique way. I think sometimes these uh, ideas and experiences with the types can be something that helps us just helps helps the feeling of the type kind of sink in a little more. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Some stories are quite simple and yet very fun. Yes. And reveal something uh, unique or interesting or startling about the types. Sometimes it's the way they put their own experience into words in a way that reflects uh, their view on the, on things. Sometimes it's just a turn of phrase that can uh, be reflective of the unique perspective that particular type has. Uh -huh. The idiosyncrasies of yes, types. Yes, yes. And stories that we've heard people tell that really, in, really encapsulate something uh, unique or funny or, uh, or endearing about yeah. the type. Yes, exactly. Uh, now, it's not because you don't identify with uh, these stories that you are not that type. You know, just have some fun with this podcast, see what you feel and how this arrives to you. Yes. And some some things we might say might just be, again, uh, short memories of someone who described their unique experience in a particular way using distinctive wording. Other things that might be little stories that reflect the, the heart of the Enneagram type. Right, right, right. So should we start? Yes, let's start. With our normal sequence? Yes, usually we start with the body types. Yes. Uh, so we'll do types 8, 9, and 1 first. So let's start with 8. So anything funny that comes to you about type 8? Oh, I can't. I, I need to mention my daughter, uh, who's most probably a type 8. Um, and when she was very, very young, uh, a kid, like four years old, she didn't read. She arrived from school. Um, my wife and I were not home. Uh, we were working outside. And she saw that the sink of her bathroom was loose. And, and then, uh, with, uh, without knowing how to read, she went to the kitchen, got on the fridge a magnet of the insurance company, called them because she could read the numbers, and asked to talk to someone. And uh, the insurance company asked what the problem was, and she said, my sink is broken, and you need to come here right now. 
She was four years old. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Come her. fix it She's right funny. now. But you were a kid. Well, um, then what? I'm talking on behalf of my mom. But what's your name? Oh, it's Beatrice. Uh, okay, so yes, what's your address? And she knew the address, and they confirmed. Then my wife was at uh, work, and she got an SMS text saying, uh, Mrs. Beatrice <laughs> <laughs> will arrive at your house in 15 minutes to fix the sink. And nobody knew about it. Wow. She didn't know about it. And they went, fixed the sink. And uh, when I, we arrived, the sink was okay. We never saw it broken. Wow. Mm. That's amazing. <laughs> she was very mature for her age. And she's she's very funny. One of the things I love about your daughter is when she loves something, she really loves it. You know, like a <laughs> TV excited, show or experience. Yeah. She has so much Almost energy. Almost every day she comes to me and say, this was the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. Uh-huh. Um, so I have a, a, a short story from that was actually told by an eight at one of our trainings in the last year. And we were talking about what works and doesn't work when we're working with people of different types. Yes. If like when like when an eight goes to therapy, like what what do they need? What works and doesn't work? And there was an eight guy who told the story. He said one of the things that didn't work for him mm-hmm. was one time when he went to a therapist and, you know, they the therapist helped him in a good way get in touch with his vulnerability and get in touch with, you know, sort of a, a deeper part of himself, which isn't easy for eights and wasn't easy for him. Um, But then at the end of the session, she didn't sort of bring him back to a place of strength and groundedness. Mm, And he said that he left the session feeling really vulnerable and it was very difficult. And so what he told us is... Uh, when you work with an eight, at the end of the session, you have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. <laughs> he yes. said you can't take Humpty, Humpty Dumpty apart and not put him back together again before he leaves the session. And <laughs> I learned a lot from that because uh, as someone who may not be as sensitive to uh, the novel experience of being vulnerable, to I Humpty might not Dumpty have known not that. Being <laughs> to Humpty being Dumpty having together. a big fall and not being put back together again. Uh, yeah, um, another story is about my father. Um, when I was born, uh, my mother and him decided that I was going to be called Flavio. And then, uh, this is the history of my name, which is very different. Urano is not a common name at all in my country, Brazil. Uh, but then when he came back home, he had registered me as Urano, which was his name. <laughs> So without asking anybody, Nobody. Uh, the mother of this child, he just registered his name. your name as his name. Yeah. So you were Junior instead of Flavio. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's great. Yes. I like that. And my daughter also, when she was uh, like six months old, she couldn't speak, but she wanted something badly. She would see that over a piece of furniture there, and she would look at it and do, oh. <laughs> That's great. She would just kind of growl if she wanted it. That's Mm. funny. That's very funny. Another story I thought of was, and this is actually, I think it's a story that's in my book, The Nine Types of Leadership, but uh, I interviewed a a man who was a doctor, a senior high-level doctor at a healthcare uh, organization I was working with, and he was funny because he described himself to me as a former Enneagram skeptic. Uh He said when he first uh, was introduced to the Enneagram, he really didn't like it. I saw lots of weights with the same condition. Yes, his first impulse was... Was, uh, to think it was, you know, kind of not really that interesting or kind of, uh, well, pardon my French, but bullshit. Uh, but then after he had an experience where he got some feedback about his leadership style and how he wasn't really bringing people with him, he was more talking at people and not uh, engaging with them enough so that he could really inspire them and move them with him uh, forward. Uh, he got some other feedback. He he was more open to feedback. And what he realized, he said, is that he had gone around his whole career 
walking around scaring people. And he also learned that his assistant was a nine. Mm -hmm. And he had this sense, all of a sudden, he realized he had gone around scaring people his whole career. And she had walked behind him everywhere he went, unscaring them. (laughs) I always thought that was funny, the way he put it. This nine, he said he had really deep respect for nines generally and for this particular woman who was a nine Uh because she would unscare people after Mm -hmm. he scared them. (laughs) Yes. Uh, You made me remember that uh, I once saw a CEO an eight CEO of a company was very harsh with a everybody, a CEO, mm-hmm. um, and <clears throat> he was very harsh. And to make things worse, uh, he he had a samurai sword hanging on the wall behind him. <laughs> a samurai sword, wow! Uh, for everybody who has seen him, but another case is a negotiator of a company. I I, I did enneagram and negotiating trainings too. Um, he would. In the middle of a negotiation, he would start defending the provider and not his company Mm. big time when he saw that the provider was being uh, treated unfairly or was like... uh, didn't have the upper hand on the negotiation. Mm. So he was such a protector, he went against his own side. Interesting. Uh, One more saying that I just think is funny that I've heard eight say is, is that instead they, I've often heard eight say that instead of ready, aim, fire, it's fire, ready, aim, (laughs) which I always think is a good way to put it. That explains well. Yes. Okay. So type nines. Uh, what are some funny anecdotes or interesting stories uh, about type nines that kind of maybe speak to the essence of the type in a humorous way? So my mother is a nine and my father is an eight. So, that we, was get, a, so yeah. we get a lot of funny stories from oh, our wow. family. I yeah. think that's the, first of all, that needs to be said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was an interesting dynamics uh, that I saw, you know, f- from very close. And I you know, nobody understood things that I sort of saw that my father was the angry man, but my mother was always provoking him behind the scenes so that he was angry. Uh He would get angry. So he was watching a soccer match on TV. She would come very slowly in front of the TV to pick something up. Uh, (laughs) Almost when his team was scoring a goal, you know. And then he would, uh, like... um, uh, say I need to say that, and then she she would look at him and say you're you're so impatient, you know, <laughs> in, with the pa- the normal passive aggression mm-hmm. of nines. Mm-hmm. I see what you mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminds me of a story uh, about a good friend of mine who's a nine, and he's married to my friend who's a five, and he told a funny story on a panel once, and that was that. Uh, sometimes when they would be having an argument or a conflict, which of course he didn't like, because um, nines tend to uh, be uncomfortable with conflict, but she would be, you know, telling him some things that he was doing that she didn't like. So she would be saying, you're doing this, and I don't like this, and I have a problem with this. And he, he's a nine, and so every time she would say something, he would say inside himself, he was thinking to himself, wow, that's a really good point. Oh, that's another really good point. <laughs> so in other words, he was really seeing her side of the story. Uh, now he knew that he didn't just want to give in and say she was right, so yeah. he wasn't telling her that he was thinking that all her points were really good. But he had a hard time finding his own side of the story, so... He said over time, what he learned to do is just ask for a couple of days to mm. be able to figure out he, that he Smart. knew that he didn't he didn't just want to give in or capitulate to what she thought was uh, happening. Uh, but he recognized that he needed some time. So instead of just totally passively resisting being part of the argument, he would say, OK, I just need give me a day to think mm. about what, what, and what my he, side of the story is. Would he mostly think that her points were good or say to her? Oh, he would never say it. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, he would I only imagine. think it. You know, that's why it was so funny that on the panel he would say what was going on in my head that, of course, I didn't share with her because he didn't want to give her the upper hand more than she already had it. <laughs> Uh, he would, but he would be thinking to himself, "Wow, that's a good mm-hmm. point. She's got, she's got, a, she's she's making a lot of sense there." But uh, but he knew that he didn't want to only take her side; that he <laughs> needed to take his own side. He just didn't know what that was yet. <laughs> yeah. So I remember a student I had a long time ago who 
as a nine, she would get the subway every day to go to work, and she would observe things that she was definitely not happy with. Uh, people, you know, doing things that she didn't agree with, um, like sitting down on a bench reserved for elderly people when they are young, right. or uh, you know, talking loudly on on the phone, uh, or you know, listening to music in ways that people would listen. And I, I, you know, I come from Brazil, so these things can happen a little more often, at least than in the country I live right now, uh, the UK. Yes. <laughs> and then one day, it was raining, and she took an umbrella with her. And she saw one man, according to her, doing all wrong things at once. <laughs> a young man sitting down on the bench for elderly people, talking loudly on the phone, while he, he, his phone, his earphones were, um, uh, you know, he was listening to music. That he was not wearing them, but everybody could hear that. <sighs> And she couldn't hold herself, and she started beating him with her umbrella. <laughs> This was after years, years of not doing anything. Uh. And, uh, and everybody celebrated mm. that, and she was very surprised. And then the guy asked her to stop because she was very strong. Mm. And, and she left in the next station, and she had this mix of uh, feeling, what, jubilant? Jubilant, jubilant about that <laughs> jubilant, and also I love that word yeah and also you know a little guilty yeah but mostly she liked it yes yes you, you hear that about nines that they don't get angry very often but every mm -hmm. once or twice a year they yeah. can really explode. or maybe once in 10 years yes some nines. depending on the nine mm -hmm. right right yeah and and you remind me of uh my right friend matt and i'm gonna Take, I'm going to mm. steal a couple of his very funny stories I've heard him tell. Hopefully he won't mind. But one of the things he always says about himself as a self-preservation nine, he said nines are a little bit like volcanoes. Like they may not erupt, but sometimes you can see the steam kind of seeping out from the cracks a little <laughs> bit. And I think that's true of him. And he told me one time he was working on learning how to express more anger as a nine on a growth path. And he was working with a couple of women. They were both both eights. Uh, and so they were working on a project to get something done. And he, he, he got kind of upset about something they were doing and they weren't really listening to him. And so he took the risk of saying that and he, and expressing how he was feeling. And one of them looked at him and they said, Oh, it looks like Matt just got mad. How cute. <laughs> <laughs> How did Matt react? <laughs> By the way, hi Matt. I think he I think he appreciated it. I think he thought it was uh -huh. funny. Matt has a very good sense of humor. Yeah, I know. I like him yes. a lot. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah, I think there are other stories. I know I, I know that you have a similar story to this one. Um, a student of mine, um, you know, a young uh, you know, woman in her twenties she wanted to break up with her boyfriend and that was happening had been happening for two years and she didn't know how to do that and then she found a way she moved from brazil to australia <laughs> yes yes that, that is exactly the story i was going to tell next is mm. there's a guy uh, who has been on panels from enneagram panels type panels for me in the past and he told a very funny story on the panel which is Uh, and he's a sexual nine, so it tends to, you know, when he's in a relationship with people, merges very deeply. Uh, and he said it was so hard for him to break up uh, when he wanted to end a relationship that he more than once, he, I think he said two or three times, he would actually move to a different city without telling the person and then get in touch with them after he'd moved and said, oh, by the way, I live in a different city and uh, our relationship is now over. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> and funny stories get repeated, yes. you know, for yes. people of the same type. Yes, exactly. So type one, uh, what is a fun story that you remember to be? Well... I have uh, both a brother and a father who were ones. Oh, so many stories. So huh? I, I thought there are probably many stories more more than I could recall today. But um, one of the things that I thought was very funny is, uh, you know, my father's not he, he's not really that into the Enneagram. But I've told him I think he's a one and why and 
Uh, he's a little resistant, but he I think he thinks it's funny. But one time I persuaded him to come to an Enneagram panel, a type one panel that I was teaching with a, a friend. And um, after the panel, I was really interested to see, you know, we had one, uh, people of each subtype. I think we had about five people on the panel. I was interested to see, like, how did he take this in? And so I went up to him and I said, so, Dad, what did you think of the, this type one panel? And he looked at me and he said, these people are crazy. <laughs> he said, especially that woman in the middle. And the person he pointed to was the person of his exact subtype, uh, the social one. And uh, I just thought, I, I thought he was sort of being funny, but I think there was also an element of truth, which is sometimes <laughs> when we see people of our own type, we can think yes, they're a little crazy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, in my on my uh, introductory workshops uh, that I did in company or uh, in companies or uh, public workshops, I used to assign tasks for each of the nine types, and they were very difficult and funny tasks to be done before the next day. Mm -hmm. And my favorite one was for once. I asked once to go to a supermarket to get um, shampoo and to leave it in the shelf of biscuits. <laughs> and and the, the color of the packing needed to be very different from uh, the ones on the biscuit. They had to do biscuit. something wrong in an obvious way. And they needed to leave very slowly without buying anything. Uh. So you can't imagine how many funny stories I heard from ones uh, that had done that story. They would freak out thinking that they were, were being... Um, you know, video recorded, that they would, were going to be arrested at any time, and they would, you know, feel right, really bad. Just a few would be able to, to um, you know, f uh, have a lot of fun. But the story that um, I remember the most right now of students doing this task is of this, uh, one, this one woman who got caught by the supermarket owner. Uh, so the supermarket owner saw her, um, you know, putting the shampoo on the biscuits shelf. And maybe the owner was a one. <laughs> and, mm. and he called her, you know, why are you doing that? And all of a sudden she took the workshop's manual that I had given her mm. and said, it's because of this teacher. <laughs> and, and she made sure that the supermarket, the mini market owner, would uh, take note of my email address oh. to send me an email complaining about that. Oh, that's great. That's great. And the funny thing about that story is you I always think when you tell that story that you're going to say that you were telling them to shoplift something, uh -huh. but you didn't even tell no, no, them to no. shoplift something. You mm -hmm. tell them to just to move something <laughs> from one place to another. And, yes. and that alone is, is, yes. is funny. Mm. One more thing about my father. When I was growing up, he had a saying that he always used to say, uh, and when I found out he was a one, I thought that was perfect. And he used to say this saying. He used to say, I'm never wrong. I've only been wrong one time in my life. And that is when I thought I was wrong, but I was incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> so I always thought that was very interesting uh, that I that was it. his favorite saying. I love it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And my niece, Flavia, uh, a one, she was, I think, like, four or five years old and her uh, her um, sister Renata was younger than her uh, like maybe two or three and my sister was at the supermarket with them and Flavia was on one of those seats on the the car and you know the little supermarket uh, how do you call it the trolley the uh, the cart the cart yes um, and uh, Renata was walking and Renata started getting products that she wanted, like almost eh, all kids do, mm -hmm. right? And Flavia from the cart looked at Renata, was really critical of her, mm -hmm. looked at her mother, my sister, and said, you need to be a better mother and take care of your daughter. Wow. Mm. <laughs> she, Four or five years she old. She was imposing the yes. rules. And of course, we know that uh, ones get resentful when they see others doing what they would like, secretly like to do. Yes, yes. Mm. 
Um, you know, one story that's uh, not so much funny as I think memorable is a good friend of mine who's a self-preservation one. Um, he uh, was, you know, having recurrent arguments with his wife. And so they went to couples counseling and they were in couples counseling for a while. And at one point, the therapist turned to him and said, you have to think about this question. Would you rather be right or be happy? <laughs> and he thought that was such a good thing for her to say. And it was really hard for him <laughs> to pick. You know, he had to think about that for a long time yeah, before yeah. he decided which one he would rather be right or be happy. Um, and I, my brother is also one. And, and, you know, I've been having arguments with him my whole life because as a social one, he thinks he's right about everything. Uh, but um, it was funny because, you know, sometimes he does get mad at his kids because, you know, they're not doing the right thing. Uh, and at one point, his little daughter, and I think this started when she was maybe six, started calling him Maddie instead of Daddy, <laughs> Maddie. And he he actually denied that it had anything to do with the fact that he sometimes got angry at them. <laughs> He thought that what it, that it, she was just saying the the name wrongly. Ex well, he thought that she was just like picking a rhyming word, uh -huh. okay. Maddie, uh, for daddy, and he didn't see that maybe it was because he sometimes got mad. <laughs> That's called denial, I think. Mm. <laughs> also, with my brother, he's been very funny because my he had his son who's now thirteen. Um, is a self-preservation nine. And my nine nephew kind of drives him crazy. And I have to say, it's been fun to watch my brother think of creative ways to try to make my nephew do the right thing because an ongoing argument, for instance, is, or the ongoing battle is he is getting, ha getting my nephew to get dressed and be ready, you know, at the right time, either in, more, in the morning when he goes is. to school or when they're going somewhere. Uh, and so um, my brother will come down and say, you know, you need to be ready for school in 10 minutes. Uh, and then, of course, he comes back 12 minutes later and my nephew, my, you know, an, an age 8, 9, 10, still naked, throwing his underwear up in the air, having a good old time and, of course, drives my brother crazy. But my brother actually got pretty creative about ways to solve it. He would record little messages and he would leave it out outside his door that were kind of funny saying like you've got five minutes left five <laughs> minutes left and then at three minutes you've got three minutes left uh and then of course he tried things like bribing him like my nephew wanted a millennium falcon falcon uh, uh starship uh star wars lego star wars ship and so my my brother basically found ways to motivate him by having him earn money toward this like this ship by him being right doing the right thing doing the right thing so if he, he found different ways to to help him do the right thing mm. <laughs> okay type two uh, so what's, can't a, wait what's an interesting or talk. funny story about type two yeah i was trying so hard to find a story about you b but all the fun stories about you are about your uh, your relationship with food oh and um you know <laughs> and, and i didn't think they were too representative of all two yeah they're a little bit more about my self-preservation dominant way, instinct yeah and the way that the self-press instinct plays out for you particularly right. so i'll try i'll keep trying to think of fun stories of you because you are very fun now one story is when I was teaching the Enneagram to bank managers in, on a bank. And though that group had uh, particularly uh, branch managers. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a type two student on a panel told a story that everybody thought was hilarious. I mean, all the other bank managers couldn't believe it. The, the man said that he had a client that he really liked and who, was, who had a big debt. Debt. Debt, sorry. And um, that he organized, um, you know, a group in that branch to give a little bit of money to the client to pay the debt. Mm. You know, as a manager, bank manager, that is almost inconceivable. Wow. So the, they did the guy that. who worked at the bank was yeah. giving the money the to the client. bank manager was negotiating. Wow. But, uh, you know, getting a little bit of each employee of that <laughs> branch. Wow. But then all of a sudden, the other manager on the panel, who was also a true, said, I did the same. 
Wow, mm. interesting, yeah. interesting. That's mm. incredible. So I have a story that's a little bit funny, but also a little bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, um, it's about my mother, who is a two. She's a self-preservation two like me. And uh, I noticed that um, she could be, let's say, a little bit watchful of my father. You know, when you there's someone you care about and you're kind of a little bit always taking care of them, watching what they're doing, reading their needs, let's say. And it can even be a little bit invasive sometimes. And one time we were at a holiday dinner and we were in the buffet line and my dad was ahead of me and and he was, you know, getting himself some food. And I guess my mother came over and was sort of like saying, oh, you should get some of this or you should get some of this. And he, it's like he finally lost it after so many years of, of her sort of being hovering a little bit and taking a little bit too, too much care of him. And he turned to her and he said, stop monitoring me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was kind of shocked because I'd never heard him respond to the Uh, fact that, you know, she was this too, like taking very good care of him, let's say. So that was kind of interesting that he that he labeled it. Stop monitoring me. So I always now I think of that when I Um, feel like I could get a little bit too invasive with people. I think to myself, stop monitoring that person. uh, We were actually having dinner with them the other day here because we've just taught uh, workshops here in the US and we were having dinner with them yes. right and uh, <laughs> your father was telling uh, us on the table how your mother shows pictures of your uh, um, your brother yeah, yes. her son yes. to many people but then she had shown a picture to someone at on, the bank i think bank, she was yeah, at, yeah. and uh, yeah so he was laughing at that and then you said this is why i never send you my own pictures anymore well the funny thing was is my mother said at first she said yeah. but i never have any pictures of you talking to me and i said well why do you think i don't send you pictures is because I know you're going to show them to people and I might not necessarily want the guy at the bank to see a picture of me. I have a scary story about shoes that, you know, it's sort of funny, but not for the people involved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so a secretary, a PA once, a type two, was uh, moved to another department of a company. Mm-hmm. And she was happy with the move, but she was feeling that she was losing that position where she was so much needed by mm. and liked by that team. Mm. And she admitted at a workshop mm. that this is what she did. She mixed up all the files in different uh, folders. Wow. For nobody to be able to find them but her. Interesting. So she would stay... People would stay dependent on her. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Oh. I could see it. I can see it. Yeah. Oh, have you done this with me? No, oh, no, no, okay, no. Thank you. I haven't done that. And <laughs> and I'm in, I'm at the stage of my development where I actually don't need people to depend on yes. me. But I tu- truly understand that <laughs> impulse from an earlier uh-huh. era of my life. Uh-huh. Um, one of the things that occurred to me as I was thinking about twos is, and again, it's it's a sort of slightly funny but also slightly um, slightly serious story. Um, and that is uh, one of the first. Uh, one of my first Enneagram resources that I accessed when I was first learning the Enneagram way back in the 90s was uh, some audio tapes, and that will tell you how old that was, uh, of Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan priest who uh, has written about the Enneagram and is a really amazing speaker and figure. And he had done this series of tapes about the Enneagram types. And when he talked about two, he said that Uh, when his secretary found out that she was a two, she cried for two weeks straight. Mm. And I always found that poignant and yet also a little bit funny because I think sometimes when we twos find our type, um, it's it's a little bit horrible because it's it's almost like we see through our own game for the first time. Mm, And so I I always thought that was a, a sort of a slightly amusing but also slightly sad story that I definitely related to. Mm. I, another thing that I that occurred to me was when I when we were thinking about funny things about twos was that um, Claudio Naranjo, one of the um, you know the seminal authors in the Enneagram world, 
uh, and certainly one of my favorite teachers about the Enneagram because I just love the different things he says and the way he, ways he interprets and communicates about the types. Um, but he used to uh, talk about how he thought Elizabeth Taylor was a good example of a sexual two. And he talked about some of the things that she said in her autobiography. And one of them was that she described all six of her husbands as the great love of her life. <laughs> and I thought that was great because we twos can be so romantic and really idealize people. Uh, and so when we're in the moment with someone, it can feel like they're the per best person ever. But then like, you know, a few weeks later, someone else is the best person ever. Uh, it reminds me of a Brazilian, a famous Brazilian composer and a poet. Vinicius de Moraes, who I think was a sexual seven, and he used to say, um, may love be infinite while it lasts. Mm, that's great. I like that saying. And another thing that Naranjo used to say while we're on the subject of twos is he used to say that he, and I totally agree with him, by the way, around this, he used to say that that the word, the label or the name, the helper or the giver is really not the best uh, label for twos that it really doesn't describe twos because it hides the fact that when twos give or help it's really strategic giving uh, and what he said was he thought that a better name would be the lover hmm. and it's really interesting I actually agree with that because sometimes the way I describe twos is they're in love with love mm -hmm. I remember Judith Searle used to have different genres yes. of uh, movies and TV shows and how different genres could have an Enneagram type and for her yeah. like romantic comedies or romances were uh -huh. type two yeah. uh, so there was that one more thing I want to say and again it's interesting that when we get to twos, the stories are a little bit funny, but also a little bit serious. And it's just a, a, a experience I had with someone who might have been a two once that stood out to me, especially because, as you know, sometimes I talk about how twos can be misunderstood because they get described as being helpers or givers mm -hmm. in yeah. sort of a simplistic way or the fact that they're looking for people with needs to meet because I certainly don't relate to that. I, I can I can sometimes run in the other direction when I encounter a needy person. So this experience I had was I was doing a typing interview and it was with a, a young woman who uh, had been referred to me because she was interested in the Enneagram, but she had tried on a few different types and she couldn't find her type. So I did a long interview, very exhaustive. And at the end, I just had a sense she was a two. Uh, but for some reason, I don't know, I, I thought that she may wouldn't necessarily hear that as good news um, but I told her at the end I think and you know when I do a typing interview I don't say I know your type but I just put it forth as a hypothesis and then I try to point to the evidence so I said I think you might be a two and here's why I think that and she was really upset she looked at me and said but I'm not a doormat yeah. Wow. And I was so shocked because I don't think of myself as a doormat. And I think she knew I was a two. So mm. it was a little disturbing, but also uh, it just, I think, reflective of how twos can be uh, seen in a way that's a little bit stereotypical yes. and yes. not so uh, accurate. Yeah, it's a bit shocking, but it's a good, good story uh, to tell us all how we sometimes stereotype. Right, and how we need to be very careful of not taking just sort of one very shallow aspect of a type and generalizing it. So type three, what are some funny or interesting anecdotes about type threes? Well, I remember my nephew, a three, uh, going to the movies when he was a, a small kid, watching animation movies, and he would identify with the characters in a way that he would at the same time watch the movie and play the role wow. while watching the movie wow and how old was he uh, i think he was three four and it was amazing he would cry together with the character <laughs> and then smile and then really be identified with the character wow he was as already shape-shifting as yes. he was watching the movie yes. characters interesting yeah, very cute also interesting mm. another thing is uh perhaps not too funny but uh it was was very interesting a big learning for me i was participating at uh, an enneagram workshop when i was sort of discovering the enneagram 
And then there were the type groups, and there was a woman on the type three group who nobody could see as a three. Everybody was, would see her as a one. Mm. Very clear, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but then she started talking and explaining her life. And she was a nun from a particular religious order that was very rigid. Mm. And she was all the time playing the role of being a one. Wow. Because that's what was expected for uh, from nuns of that particular religious order. Interesting. And then as the workshop went on, she completely changed into a very fun person. Um, because that was a, a bit more who she was. Very interesting. Yeah, I think sometimes... People who are type threes have a hard time finding themselves, finding their type, because they may have uh, taken on the role of different mm -hmm. types. They may have conformed to an image or more than one image of a, that mm -hmm. kind of matches up with another type, Dep depending on what context they've yeah, been in. Depending or, on what is expected by that context. Exactly, exactly. Um, I heard a story once uh, told, and it's one of these sort of, um, uh, it's a little bit more of a, a funny spiritual, you know, one of these short stories. And I thought it really described three a lot. Um, and it was a story where um, this sort of seeker comes to the spiritual master and he's seeking enlightenment. And so he says to the spiritual master, you know, how can I, I want to become enlightened. I have this real spiritual hunger for God. How can I become enlightened? Uh, I want to know what to do. And so the spiritual master gives him a particular meditation. And he says, go home and do this meditation every day, twice a day, uh, and then come back to me uh, and, and let me know how you're doing. So the guy does this for about six months and he comes back. And he says, okay, I've been doing this, you know, every day and um, I'm still not enlightened yet. And so I'm wondering when, when is it going to happen? Because I want to be enlightened and I'm, I'm not there yet. And the master said, no, you're not. And he said, but you know what? You're working so hard at this meditation. For most people, it would take a year. For you, it's going to take five years. <laughs> <laughs> because he's working so hard and sometimes uh, i find threes when you're when we're uh, especially in spiritual context they'll sort of do meditation yeah, or they'll do a spiritual yes. practice and not really surrender to the experience and the drama is when they think they are in that uh experience but it's more playing a role yes right the, the, you know it's identifying of with the role of being a spiritual seeker right mm, right that's the dangerous part yes I had a client once, a coaching client, uh, you know, an executive coaching client, and he, I was trying to address the the problem that he was very impatient, and people would would be, you know, a little bothered with that, mm -hmm. um, but he didn't allow me at all to work on that particular thing with him, mm -hmm. and when I tried, he said. Um, give up, Uranio. Uh, when I go to the gym and I go there every day, I can't, <clears throat> I can't do the normal stretching of my leg, like um, bending, you know, the the lower part of the, of the leg just to stretch the thigh. Mm. I can't. I need at the same time that I do that, I need to stretch the ankle of the other head, the other leg, like um, when you when you position your foot on a chair uh, the tip of the foot up mm -hmm. uh, you know move it uh, to an upper part mm -hmm. uh, you stretch your ankle mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so he needed to do both at the same time wow. just not to lose time oh i so see so he had to stretch both legs at the same time he was in so much of a hurry yeah to do things all at once so he wouldn't imagine that uh, he would be able to develop patience interesting and he interesting. gave me this example well i have some a couple and of then then i noticed that during the coaching session under the table he was stretching his <laughs> Yeah. He was multitasking yeah. during your coaching session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was flexing both ankles, eh? Yes. <laughs> uh, there's sometimes uh, 
threes have some funny uh, things they say in response to uh, when they learn their Enneagram type in response to certain three aspects. And that is uh, a friend of mine said that um, one one of the things she thought of when she realized she was a three and she realized that sometimes threes have a hard time slowing down and getting in touch with their emotions. She said she's like she thought to herself, yes, because feelings aren't aerodynamic. In other words, she wants to keep moving really fast and the feelings are not aerodynamic. And another three said almost the same thing, but using different funny words. And that is, he said that um, he always thinks about that that feelings have a high drag coefficient. In other words, they slow you down. And, and I thought that was a beautiful mathematical term to explain why he avoided feelings. Uh, so type four? Type four. So tell me a story, a fun story about fours. So um, this is uh, something that I saw a friend of mine say on a panel once, which I just thought was very, very funny. Um, So she was describing being a social four. And um, at one point I asked her about what what, what was a challenge that she experienced in relationships. And she thought about it for a minute and she said, well realizing that there's another person there besides me. <laughs> I thought that was very honest. Yeah, force can be very self-referencing. Um, I remember in my teenage years, a good friend of mine was, um, you know, he had a girlfriend and they were, they had this wonderful relationship. And uh, then all of a sudden he broke up with her. But, you know, imagine that he was the happiest ever in mm. that moment and he broke up mm. and they they were really in love for each other and you know after talking to him he said mm, maybe maybe i want to relieve the emotion of the beginning when we come back <laughs> so, <laughs> but the problem was he, he when he broke up he suffered and he got sort of enamored of his own suffering and he never came back oh no he was looking forward to feeling the feelings of when he came back after the breakup but he never got there interesting Mm -hmm. that reminds me of something i heard a guy say at a a class i was in once he said that um it took him a really long time to propose marriage to his girlfriend because he was so aware of how his feelings shifted all the time Mm -hmm. He thought, well, I'm in love with her right now, today. Like, I feel like a lot of love for her, but I could feel completely differently tomorrow. (laughs) And and how do I know how I'm going to feel tomorrow or the next day? Uh, Uh, So I thought that was a great uh, great description of sometimes what fours can experience. (laughs) Yes, any other story, then I tell another one. Yes, well, I want to uh, I want to tell a story that is basically something you sometimes say to fours at workshops, which mm-hmm. I think is very uh, mm-hmm. it, it really helps fours. Uh, it almost surprises them to the point of really realizing something in a good way, and that is, and I'm thinking of uh, one experience we had with a four on a panel, and uh, she was a social four, and she was complaining a lot she was talking a lot about what wasn't really okay in her life and there was this problem and that issue and this other thing that she suffered from and you you listened patiently for a while and then you looked at her and you said I have some very very bad news for you and she was like what more bad news and he said you said I have very bad news for you I don't know how you're going to cope with it I don't know how you'll take it are you ready? And of course, she had already been sort of getting sad from all the the hard things she was sharing. But she she braced herself and said, okay, I'm ready. And you said, you're very happy. I don't know how you'll cope with that reality. And the funny part was, is she was so shocked at what you were saying, but she was smiling. So her smile was so big. And so of course, then you pointed that out. You said, you're smiling. You're really happy. How are you going to deal with this? And she was completely shocked i remember that because she was referring to sad stories of the past and you know but not really paying attention to the fact that she was not as sad anymore right that she wasn't in that past story anymore and that in the present moment she was actually doing quite well and sometimes Mm. fours don't always take that in in a way that they could right 
Yeah, and there is a funny story that I remember now uh, from, uh, you know you know him, Nicolai, my friend from Brazil, who's also an Enneagram teacher. Yes. He's a seven. Yes. And he has a son who's a four. Ah. And although Nicolai works a lot on himself and does a good job, he, um, he couldn't help, you know, one time uh, because he was seeing his uh, son in suffering and going deeper in suffering so they were at the restaurant mm -hmm. and he he showed to his son one of those i don't know if you guys have this in here in the u.s i've never seen it those potato chips with a face like smiling like mr potato head or no it's a, an actual the, potato an actual chip. potato chip that we eat oh. and and it's round and there is a smile and, that is so the funny eyes. because brazil is a seven country <laughs> and i wonder if they have smiling oh, potato chips in brazil perhaps, but nowhere yes. else <laughs> <laughs> and Nikolai is a seven, so he showed his son, look, even the potato ship is smiling. And his son, very young, got the potato ship and turned it upside down and said, he can be sad also. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And it reminds me of a story that a friend of mine who I went through my therapy training told me once. She, she had a daughter who was nine years old and um, it was her birthday. And so they were creating this big, getting ready for the big birthday party where she was going to turn 10 uh, and putting all the streamers up and getting the house decorated. And then she saw her daughter was crying. And she said, why are you crying? We're about to have this great birthday party for you. And she said, yes, I know, but I'll never be nine again. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. I thought that was great. Well, one more story I want to tell. Well, about um, just a friend of mine. It's a little bit more of a self-preservation for story. And sometimes... Uh, well, we often have a lot of self-preservation fours at our workshops. Yeah, and, and some are very funny. Some are very funny. And it, one of the things that can be funny about self-preservation fours is they don't realize how funny it is, that how hard they work, and how masochistic they can yeah, be. Yeah. Uh, they just sort of think, they come to think of it as normal, so they don't realize that to the rest of us, they're carrying a much bigger load than they really ought to. Uh, and one time, uh, I have a friend who's, a great person, uh, self-preservation for. And um, she told me that um, she needed to get ready for her house cleaner who was coming over. I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, I can't do anything today because I'm, she would clean right next to her house cleaner oh. and she would actually work harder than the house cleaner. Mm -hmm. And I said, why do you even have a house cleaner coming over mm -hmm. if you're going to be next to her cleaning right next to her working right. harder than she is? And one time we went to a friend's house for dinner. This, uh, my same friend, the self-preservation four. And at the end of dinner, you know, we were helping the hostess clean up and Stacy was, um, my friend was cleaning the uh, stove and she, and the hostess came in and she said, stop, stop. It's cleaner than it was when I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So self pres fours can be funny. I agree. So can we skip fives? No. I'm oh. sure there are a lot of funny stories about fives. But can fives be funny? Yes, yes. Oh. You're a five and you're very funny. Am I? Yes, yes. You, you make me laugh on a mm. daily basis. <laughs> okay, so tell me a story about fives who are funny. Well, first of all, I have to tell a story from just the other night, mm -hmm. and that is when you as a five uh, came, We so sometimes at our retreats, we have parties in the evening, usually on the last night, uh, and it's a come as you aren't party where you have to, it's a, as a growth stretch, you, you come as a character that's very different from yeah. who you are. We sometimes call it the sulfuric acid party. The sulfuric acid party. And like. you came and you're a head type, you're a five, and you came as a heart type. And it was very funny because you cut out a red heart from a piece of red paper and you wrote at your service on it. <laughs> and you made me laugh so hard all night. I couldn't stay in my own character. Um, you made every time I looked at you, I laughed so hard because you had the biggest smile on your face. And you were like, <laughs> it was this particular kind of smile that was 
so funny and you kept coming really close to people and mm. and 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 when someone would tell it would, would say something to you that wasn't so nice you would act like you were about to cry <laughs> and it was just so funny so i found that mm. to be very funny i had someone in mind when i was I'm trying sure to cry i'm sure you did i'm sure you and did and someone else in mind when i was uh, laughing or smiling sorry. smiling yeah. yeah you were your smile your particular yeah. smile was very funny so i think a five playing a heart type can be very funny yeah i don't think i would was very uh, credible. Oh, you were extremely credible. I mean, in a funny way, but you were doing a good job, which is part of why it was so humorous. <laughs> okay, so um, once I was traveling with my wife on Chile, and we were in a park, uh, I mean, a, you know, a reserve, and a dog came from nowhere, a very <laughs> wild dog, um, you know, from a neighboring property, I think the dog found found a way in to the mm. park and attacked us. Mm. And while my wife uh, threw herself on from a quite a, a frightening height and actually broke her arm. Oh wow! And she tried to save me. Also, I, I'm glad she didn't because I would perhaps break my arm. Also, uh, I couldn't move because you know fives are. Uh, you know, a little slower than other people at times. And um, the dog uh, beat my butt <laughs> very hard. Uh, you know, I had a month or two with the marks, uh, the mark of the, the bite. And um, that is to say that fives can be weird and funny in, in the way that they freeze at times mm. in front of um, some threat. You although maybe don't take action when they should. Yeah, although, you know, that may have something to do with my self-preservation repressed instinct also. Yes. Well, I want to tell a couple stories about one of my best friends um, who is a self-preservation five. Uh, and uh, hopefully she won't mind that I'm telling these stories, although she's a five, so she probably will mind very much, but I'm going to tell them anyway. Um, so she is, she's funny. She used to talk about how she doesn't like everybody and how when she meets people, she was trying to think of a metaphor that described how she doesn't really want everyone she meets to actually be in her life. And she said, it's a little bit like a sieve. You know what a sieve is where the water flows through and mm, it holds yeah. some things back, but then the liquid comes through. She said, life is like a sieve to me. And I want a lot of people that I meet to get caught in the sieve <laughs> and not actually flow through and be in my life. <laughs> and so it was the sieve uh, theory of being uh, a self-preservation five. I like it. And it Go ahead. Well, another story about her, it's actually in my book, The Complete Enneagram. I just think it's very funny. I have to repeat it. Um, she said that when she first moved into her house and uh, she, for as a self-preservation five, her home is very important to her. She likes it to be alone in her house and she doesn't like people to drop by unexpectedly. She doesn't really, it feels in, in like an invasion. And when she first moved into the house, her next door neighbor um, invited her to join a book club. And she said it sounded as if the woman invited her to run away with her and join the circus. It was that, it sounded that bad to her. She did not, there's no way that she wanted to be in a book club with her next door neighbor. It's like she needed space from her neighbors. She doesn't go to uh, the block party. She doesn't really want to get to know the people that live around her because when she's at home, she wants to have a lot of privacy and personal yeah. space. I sort of understand her, yes. Now, I once... Um... You know, a very fun five was telling a story that he likes so much to run in a specific park every morning. Mm. And he balances himself and he has his quiet moment, he's alone mm. and he's exercising. But then there was this other man who was trying to make friends and would approach him in, in one of the stops of, of that circuit mm -hmm. and would start talking to him mm -hmm. and then once and then twice another day mm. and and then the guy said the, the, the other man said oh, it would be wonderful maybe we can run together mm. uh, from now mm -hmm. and then he said yeah very good idea tell me the times that you come to the park <laughs> I think you imagine what yes, was the intention, right? Yes. Never, ever again he came 
to the park on the same times. Right, mm. right. That mm. reminds me a little bit of another five friend of mine who uh, he would drive home to his house and park his car in front of his house. And a couple of times his neighbor from across the street saw him and called over to him and wanted to talk to him. And he said he found himself walking backwards toward his house while he was trying not to have the person talk to him. <laughs> I can identify with that also. Yeah. There, there is this weird thing, B. If I am um, in some somewhere public and I see someone I know, even if it's someone I miss and I would like to talk to, my very first reaction is to go unnoticed. Mm. You know, I try not to be seen. Yes. Sometimes I go against it, but there were times that I really wanted to talk to the person, mm -hmm. but I couldn't because there was something stronger in me ah. that made me hide. Interesting. The impulse to hide is so mm. strong. Now, uh, a student of ours the other day, she might listen to this workshop and remember this comes from her. <laughs> this said, podcast. Yes. Um, and uh, she said something I really liked. She said, my head has a PhD, but my body is still in kindergarten. <laughs> That's great. Yes, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, another thing about my friend who's the self press five, she... Uh, she she's a high school math teacher and when people find that out they are sometimes surprised like you know how is it that a five who might want to be more alone or may may not always want to have people around them you know be around teenagers all day every day she said well actually I really like being a high school math teacher but the thing I like most is that every day at the same times of day the bell rings and everyone leaves and I was telling her the other day that I sometimes tell this story and she said yeah and you know what's been happening lately I have a student who doesn't leave when the <laughs> bell rings and it's really horrible and I don't know what to do because I'm trying to find ways to let the student know it's time to leave. Ah, yes. And all the, all the other teachers kind of get a little bit insulted that she doesn't come have lunch with them at the teacher's lounge. But she said, I really like staying alone in my room. It's my favorite part of the day. I know how that is. Yes. So type six. Um, yeah, my, my wife is a six, as you know. And... Um, you know, I have several stories. She tells me a story of when she was a child and she liked to go eat a little bit of salt. You know, she liked it. Mm -hmm. And and she, she has an aunt who was a little bit, you know, controlling of her and, and she would um, like think that this aunt is a bit um, um, threatening, although she's very nice also, I know mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. the aunt and then she was getting the salt and she heard the sound coming mm. you know all the mm -hmm. noise and then what she did because of the six anxiety was to get a whole bunch of salt and put on her mouth oh, ouch. Anxiety. <laughs> and she couldn't talk and then she would say i'm dying i'm dying uh, and not nothing too bad but right you know. just an overdose of salt yes, yes. But that that speaks about the six anxiety and fear right you know? right right one funny story, <clears throat> I was on a trip with a six friend and we had we were in different hotel rooms and we had to leave very early uh, the morning after the event that we were at was over. We, we had to catch a, a, a taxi to the airport at 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, um, sixes sometimes, you know, have a startle response where they get kind of uh, startled by something. And so I was waiting for her down in the hotel lobby at 5 a.m. and she wasn't there and she wasn't there. And it was like about three minutes after five. And I thought, well, I better call her just in case. So I called her up and she answered the phone. She went, oh, my God. I thought it was I thought I thought it was 5 a.m. And then she was just relaxing like she had the scared response. Yeah. And then she was telling herself, oh, it's not really. That. And I said, well, actually, it is 5 a.m. <laughs> So I felt a little bad because she was all freaked out. Uh, and then she was telling herself that, oh, no, I thought it was 5 a.m., but it's not really. And yeah. then I had to say, no, actually, it is it 5 a.m. So your original startle was really accurate. Uh, that's funny. My, my wife once, you know, I think it was the very same trip that I mentioned to Chile. But before we were, we were going there, uh, we were planning to, to hike up a mountain that's actually a volcano. It's not, nothing too uh, difficult or dangerous, just a little bit. 
And uh, she was very concerned with that, very concerned. So she would dream every day about that. And in one of the dreams, she saw scary things happening you know, on the dreams. And she saw me having an accident. Hmm. When I woke up... Was it was it getting bitten in the butt by a dog? No, 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 no. <laughs> no dogs in the volcano, oh, okay. in the mountain. But she saw me having some sort of accident. Mm -hmm. And she was scared. When I woke up, I couldn't find particular pieces of clothes uh, that, I, that I loved. And then she confessed... On her dream, I was wearing those pieces ah. of clothes and she threw them away. <laughs> no, she threw them away. That's funny. Oh, so that her and dream I never didn't had come them true. Again. Yes. Oh, that's funny. That's yeah, and funny. one student uh, once said that she was being followed in the street and it was, according to her, a dark street. Nobody, nobody else was there and she was... And she couldn't see the person. Mm. And there was this noise of someone really close to her following her. She was running, but it got worse the more she ran. Mm. And she was, like, terrified. Mm. And all of a sudden, she realizes it was a noise of her own uh, uh, pair of jeans ah. touching her shoes. <laughs> so she was scaring herself. Yes. Oh, that's funny. I just want to mention a couple of funny phrases that David Daniels, our our uh, our beloved uh, first Enneagram teacher, both of ours, uh, used to say. He was he was a six himself, and he would say that because sixes are such good problem solvers, they become problem seekers. <laughs> he also used to refu refer to sixes as proof junkies. Uh, they're always looking for proof uh, of something that they may think or fear is the truth. And it's funny that uh, when you become pessimist, uh, pessimistic, the six becomes optimistic. Yes, it's so true. It's, it's so the, fun. It's the that, contrarian tendency. Yeah, once there was a woman uh, saying, I will never get this job, so I'm not sending my resume. And I said... <laughs> yeah, resume. Yeah, resume, yeah. yeah. So then I said, mm, uh, tell me more details of this. And then she explained why she wouldn't get the job. And I said, you know, I was going to help you, but I think you were right. And I think that it's very difficult. And you won't get you, the job. And you won't most get likely. the job. Yeah. And then the next day she had sent the resume. Oh, you know? that's perfect. It's contrary thinking. Yes, a paradoxical intervention. Yes. Yes. So type seven. I, I think you have a few stories about type seven. So, so. Yeah, my son is a seven, my first ah, son, Raphael. And your son and is very funny. Yes, he is. And when he was three years old, I thought he was a five because usually I see seven uh, kids being very introspect uh, and, and also looking like fives. A little bit more shy in the beginning. A little shy in the beginning. But I, I also saw, and I was really in the doubt uh, between uh, five and seven, and once we were watching an animation movie, Lilo and Stitch. Do you yep. remember that? Yeah. And then um, there was a very sad part of the movie that the social assistant was taking Lilo away from her sister from home because a few things had happened. I looked at him by my side and he was starting to cry, really feeling sad and frightened. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he jumped out of, out, out of the couch, went to the DVD, pressed stop. I didn't know he knew how to do any of that. Pressed stop, eject, got the CD, uh, put it on the case, um, uh, put the, the CD, uh, you know, the CD ca case, case yeah. on, on its place, um, eject again to close the, the CD ROM thing, uh, uh, turned off the CD machine, turned off the receiver, turned, turned off the TV and looked at us very happy and said, let's go play in my room. <laughs> Oh, my sleeping wow. room. So we got rid of the sad story completely. Yes. Wow, that's amazing at that mm -hmm. young age. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Another friend of mine, a very, very good friend of mine, Wagner, he, I, I, I used to say, Wagner, your problem professionally is that you don't focus. You don't have focus. You are doing this, this, and that, and you have these three jobs, 
and you you don't focus and he said yes i know i know but what do you need to do should you stop working with this and you know just work with something you need focus you need focus then one day he came to me and said i finally managed to have focus as you tell me and he gave me a business card of a new company he had created of a fourth <laughs> job called focus <laughs> That is amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I have uh, I have several friends who are sevens, and my particular uh, three of the people who are closest to me are self preservation sevens, and they're all guys. Um, and they're all three of the funniest people I know. And one of them uh, I've known since I was about seven years old, and he has some things that he says a lot and he tells a lot of jokes and one of the things he always says is like he'll tell people when he first meets them is he'll say I'm fun at parties <laughs> <laughs> he also quotes his mother uh, who has uh, who has said that um, that he has a way with the ladies <laughs> this was before he was married but uh, yeah he would always uh, again bring these things out as ways of talking about himself I, I don't know you but I noticed that when sevens tell jokes they they laugh so much yes, at the jokes yes. that people sometimes laugh at their laugh. Exactly. Laughter. He uh, tells a joke and then he laughs at how funny he is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Not a very good straight man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, once I saw a, a seven who was freaking out with the fact that he needed to tell his closest friend that his grandmother had died. You know, sevens are not particularly good in bringing bad news, right? Mm -hmm. And he thought of a way to do that, that the friend will be less, you know, upset. Mm -hmm. And then he came up with a way. Mm -hmm. He came to his friend and said, your mother died. And the friend, <gasps> my mother, my no, 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 be okay, because it's only your grandmother who died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just my grandmother. Oh, I loved her, but it's okay. Though. Yes, interesting, mm. interesting. It's mm. funny because sometimes when I um, when I do introductions to the Enneagram for teams and businesses, I often say that one of their one of the seven mottos is, "Why would you feel bad if you could feel good?" <laughs> and it's funny because like one or two sevens in the group always says something along the lines of. I always say that. I actually yes. say that all the time. Like, I why would you feel bad if you could feel I good? I can't even tell how many times I heard the very same B. Yeah. 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 It's very common. Yeah. So the top five today is the top five funniest, most humorous types. Yes, at least in average, because I don't think there is a total uh, clear pattern. Like some people of one type and subtype are funny, but others aren't. That's right, funny. and I think any type could really be funny. Yeah. Any type or subtype could be funny. I think these are just uh, types that we notice uh, being funny a lot. You know, like there are a lot of people who are either known for being funny of that type or you, the people, the, the, the majority of people you run into of that type have a pronounced sense of humor. Yes. Uh, so this, this, is, this is our top five for this week. What is your number five? So I have to confess, I have a couple of ties this time. So maybe okay. I'm cheating a little bit. But, okay. but the, for my, my number five was a tie between self-pres eights and self-pres twos. Wow. Mm. Because I've met some self pres eights that are kind of funny because they don't always say a lot, but then when they come out with something, mm. it's very humorous, it's, you know, in a way that you true, don't actually. really expect. Yeah. Um, I also think self preservation twos, if I do, do say so myself, can be funny. Now, I've, I never think of myself as a funny person, I think of myself as someone who really, really appreciates people who are funny you have fun with fun people yes and i quite easily and i really admire people who have a good sense of humor yeah. i mean they don't have to be saying funny things but they appreciate funny things uh, but i also really like being around people who are funny because yeah, uh, i like to laugh also usually i think self-pressed truths are um happy 
Yes, and right. I've just known some twos, and not always self pressed twos. I'm thinking now of a couple twos that were uh, a few twos that were our, at a retreat this past week were very funny. Um, but uh, but I just noticed I like I had a client once who's very funny. She's a self preservation too, uh, and and I just think that they tend to be playful and 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 sort of light and, and humorous. Yeah, I agree. What My number five is it might surprise you. It's sexual three. It does and surprise me. That's because I've seen a lot of sexual threes who found their way uh, to be accepted and to, to you know relate well with people by telling jokes, by being funny. Maybe it's a Brazilian thing, but I think that sexual threes try to fit in by doing that sometimes. Not always though. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Now that you're saying that, I'm thinking of a couple of sexual three friends that I have that I do think are funny and light and appreciate humor. Uh, and sometimes I think it's self-deprecating humor because yes. they can be a little bit shy. So it's not the kind of humor that you might expect of maybe a social three to be something that's a little bit self-promoting. It's more uh, it's more sort of making fun of themselves or putting someone else in the spotlight or uh, being light and funny in a way that's not about drawing attention to themselves, but it's more about appreciating what's happening. Yes. What is your number four? So my number four is, and I I, I put it this way, I, I said healthy ones. Oh, yes. I think when ones are in a growth path, mm. uh, when they've done some inner work and they've risen above the sort of basic personality level, I think they can be very funny. Uh, I know, like for instance, um, you know, my my brother can be very funny. My I have a very good friend who's a self-preservation one, and he's very funny. But and I one time saw an Enneagram panel at one of the first Enneagram courses I did with the Narrative Tradition School, and I remember there were three guys on this panel, and I remember thinking it was one of the funniest panels I'd yeah. ever seen. They were all very light. They'd all it was very obvious they'd done a lot of work on themselves, and it was one of the funniest panels I'd seen. Yeah, I didn't choose any ones for my top five this time, but I think I agree with you. It, maybe it's I didn't choose them because maybe it's not doesn't happen as off, often. You right. Know? But uh, I agree with you. There are very funny ones. But my number four is self press four. Oh. Again, I think it's about the same. Uh, not not all of them are funny, but when they are funny, they are really funny. Mm -hmm. And I know many self press fours who are funny. Yes. At least in Brazil. You know, yes. maybe there is a cultural bias here. Yeah. Um, I was in a doubt between self press and sexual fours, actually, but I think that self press won this one. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, what I think that's a, a good one. Your number three. So my number three is one more tie. This is the last tie I'll have in this top five, I promise. No problem. But for number three, I have a tie between self-preservation nine and five. And I tried wow. to decide a, a particular subtype of five, but I couldn't because I could think of really funny fives I know from all three. I think I would say self-present social maybe a little more than, than, than sexual because sexual fives can sometimes be more deep and dark than they are funny. But I also thought of a of a five I know, but I actually think he's a self-preservation five. So I probably self-preservation and social. And of course, uh, I think you're one of the funniest people I know. Um, you know, I think I think fives are funny when they get really close to people. Uh, They're yes. not usually funny for everybody to see. Yes, you know? yes, yeah, and I think that's true because I didn't always think you were fun as funny as mm. I think you are now. Mm. Uh, but also self-preservation nine because I have two friends that I'm thinking of in particular who are self-preservation nines who are very funny, and it's a kind of again self-deprecating humor. It's a it's a sort of wry, not what you would expect, but really ever-present kind of yeah. this. And actually, I'm thinking of three people now. Yeah. One of my kidding. best yeah. friends from age three is is a self preservation nine, and she's she. I think of her as inherently funny, <laughs> like that she can just be standing there, not saying anything, just have a look on her face, and yeah. I can start laughing. Yes, yes. Um, my number three is self press two. Oh, you, yeah. Uh, wow. For the, the reasons we already talked about. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad I made your list, and that's pretty high. Yeah. Great. What is your number two? My number two is self-pres seven. Mm -hmm. 
because I think sevens generally can be very funny. Uh, but I'm, you know, I have several friends who are, so, and you know, I've noticed there's a lot of self-preservation subtypes on my list. Yes. Uh, and I think it has to do with sometimes like the humor that comes out of being a little bit fearful or anxious. Yeah. And it's almost like either a way to cope with the anxiety or, it, it's a it's sort of a, a little bit of a dark sense of humor that comes from looking at life from a certain angle uh, but I just noticed that in my list and I haven't really yeah. thought of that before for me too I thought of the same uh, three of my five are self presses interesting and I think that there is some irreverence with yes. self presses you know that are bigger yes and nice for humor yeah and but I think self preservation sevens uh, can be just just very funny part of it's the maybe the focus on pleasure uh, but I, I have several friends who are self-preservation funny self-preservation funny self-preservation sevens who are very humorous yeah I had self press sixes as second um, I think that sixes are really one of the funniest types and among the sixes I believe it's a little more common that self press sixes are fun um, uh, you know I believe that a big a big number of the stand-up comedians are sixes I don't know if you agree with that well I agree because it's my number one <laughs> my number one most funniest pr uh, type is self-preservation six yes and I agree with you that the self-preservation sixes tend to be funny there's a lot of famous comedians that I think are self-preservation six and I think there's a lot of humor uh, out of that comes out of that self-preservation six perspective and I was thinking about it I was thinking about well what about the other six and I do think that sometimes social sixes and sexual sixes can be funny. However, I think their humor comes in a serious package. In other words, it looks kind of serious at first, yeah. uh, but then there's something funny underlying it. Yeah. Or there's they are a, a bit ambivalent and it makes it even funnier. Yes. Yeah. What about you? What's your number one? My number one is type seven in uh -huh. general. Um, I think that they are quite uh, uh, quick-witted, they are very spontaneous, they, you know, we have a saying in Brazil that I think applies to all Brazilians, but when it's a Brazilian seven, mm. then it's even more, it, it goes a little bit like, we lose the friend, but we don't lose the joke, we don't miss <laughs> the joke. You know, <laughs> so I think that uh, is true to sevens. Um, and but I had to choose one of the subtypes, and I went for sexual sevens and not ah, for self-pressed sevens. Interesting. I think they tend to be really funny, but I can totally see why you chose for your second self-pressed seven. Yeah. Also, yeah. So I, I'm still an adult, really, but I really like sevens. Yeah. I find them funny and relaxing. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great so, talking to you, B, about you. Uh, fun things. Yes. A lighter podcast. We hope that you uh, who are listening to us have enjoyed and learned and, some things. And this has been the Enneagram 2.0 podcast. I'm Beatrice Chestnut. I am Uranio Pais. Join us again next time as we talk about all things Enneagram. <laughs>